Welcome to the Health of Woman podcast. Today is Monday, May 18th, 2020. I'm really excited about our two podcasts today, both with Dr. Sarp Axel. Sarp and I worked together at MFM Associates. He joined us last year out of residency and is simply amazing. In the first podcast, The World According to Sarp, we discuss how Sarp came to medicine and OBGYN, his love of clean socks, and how he got his name. We also discuss his involvement in advocacy. Sarp volunteers a considerable amount of his time advocating for women's reproductive rights and representing young OBGYNs on a national level, and he is already an important national figure in this space. We recorded that first podcast on March 11th, right as Corona was hitting New York City. Since that time, Sarp jumped into a new area of advocacy as he and a group of friends started a grassroots effort to donate personal protective equipment, or PPE, to healthcare workers in New York City. This effort has received national attention and was recently highlighted in The New Yorker, which are both well-deserved. He's an exceptional person, and I'm proud to work with him. In the second podcast, PPE, Yeah, You Know Me, shout out to any youngsters who get that reference, Sarp and I discuss the problem of PPE and what he and his friends are doing about it. I'm intentionally dropping these two podcasts at the same time. In the first one recorded before Corona, it is clear how thoughtful and giving Sarp is, and then in the second one, we see how Sarp used those passions to make a huge impact in the community. It is like the first podcast predicted the second, and it's really cool to hear them back to back, even though they're separated in time by about six weeks. On Thursday, we have another great podcast with Emily Oster. This was supposed to be recorded and dropped last week, but Emily and I had to reschedule. We blame Corona. As I mentioned last week, Emily was my first guest on Healthful Woman, and I asked her to come back so we could discuss the next phase of the corona pandemic, if and when and how to start lifting social distancing and stay-at-home restrictions. Emily is my go-to person for data analysis, and she is amazing at using data to make sensible suggestions and recommendations. Same disclosures last week. I don't actually know what she will say or where the conversation will, will go, as we have not recorded yet, but any podcast with her is one you definitely do not want to miss. Thanks again for listening to Healthful Woman. Have a great day. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Today, we're talking with Dr. Sarp Axel. Sarp, welcome to Healthful Woman. Thanks for having me. This is fantastic. So we were talking before the podcast, and I was under the assumption that Sarp had podcasted before, but in fact, not true, right? Not true. Not true. Only radio, and that was only a couple times. So this is a radio personality we're speaking with today, Dr. Axel. That's great. <laughs> as I said, I was surprised he hadn't been podcasting before because he's so woke, as as they say. I hear that all the time. And then I said that we were thinking of titling this The World According to Sarp. And then we just had to start recording because what'd you tell me? My mom watched The World According to Garp and liked how it sounded. And she's like, I could probably find a word in Turkish that sounds very similar to Garp. And she came up with Sarp. So Sarp is a Turkish name. It, it sounds like Garp. It is. It sounds like Garp. It's, you know, Sarp. Does Sarp have a meaning to it? It does. It's true Turkish. A lot of words in Turkish, you know, have their origins from Arabic or, you know, other other areas um, in the region. But but Sarp is purely Turkish. And so that was a big part of what drew my mom to it. It's a mountaineering term. It means hard to achieve. It's used to describe like really steep, hard to overcome peaks. So it's like it's like an adjective. It is. It's an adjective. So this cl this mountain is Sarp. Yes. In Turkish. Like that's a really sharp mountain peak. Wow. I think they really should come into the vernacular, you know, like whatever is that. I've got this crossword puzzle today and it's God, just that's so really sharp. It's just so sharp. So I can't sarp. do it. Right. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So sharp is an OBGYN practicing at Maternal Fetal Medicine Associates. There you go. Uh, the same place I practice. Work together, which is great. And How's it been going so far? It's been great. I mean, I, I started in September, had some fears, you know, never never met a private practitioner of the OBGYN specialty before. Okay, and why is that? That's not where I did my training. You know, I, I never really encountered any private docs. Everyone was sort of, you know, an employee of the OBGYN department and, you know, the, the labor and delivery floor residents 
took care of all the patients. There were there was no distinction between private or not. It, they were just your patients. Right. And you trained at Einstein. I did. I trained up in the Bronx, did med school in the Bronx, did residency in the Bronx, and then uh, decided to come down south a little bit. And so thus far, it's been okay. You seem to be adapting well it's, to this it's been new great. environment of it's yours. It's been great. You know, a big part of what I loved about my training um, in OBGYN was the personal relationships I had with my patients. You know, oftentimes they'd meet me for the first time on labor and delivery, and then we'd have a great experience delivering their child. And then afterwards, they'd only come and see me. So those were the relationships that I found to be the most rewarding parts of my job. Unfortunately, as you know, residency doesn't lend itself to continuity of care. You're shuffled from place to place and one month you're on OB and another month you're on GYN, another right. month you're doing research or you may be in another hospital doing nights and so it's hard. Right. And so now that you're in a more sort of, I guess, set schedule in the same place, I know at least what I see is how much the patients enjoy seeing you and how much they have enjoyed meeting you and getting to know you. How's it been on your end? First off, that's great to hear. Always nervous. This is the Always first have... positive feedback I've given to Sarp <laughs> in a year. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, I just just yell and scream at him all day. You know, <laughs> this is I, I'm going to cherish this moment. Fox, this is good. Yeah. Fox Fox's encouragements and praises. Yeah. Is, is, yeah. They're rare. It's gold. Yeah. It's gold. It really is. <laughs> you know, still have a little bit of that imposter syndrome. Everyone's been super friendly and the patients are great. And, you know, I've just really enjoyed getting to take care of this patient population. It's really nice. There are aspects of it that I wasn't expecting. You know, there, there are a lot of folks that I take care of that are that are my age. And it's nice to see that we're able to have that sort of contemporary conversation. And, and I'm still able to give them information in a way that makes sense for them. And they're able to use that to make medical decisions. That's one of the things that I that I've learned from you and Bender and you know, we give recommendations and, and patients make decisions. So I like to use that a lot when patients are like, what would you do? Not about what I would do. It's about what you would do. And so I, I've, I've really enjoyed that that part of the job. Right. It's interesting when you mention your age or the age of the patients. And it, it's so interesting because in medicine, our careers range in age from, I don't know, 30-ish till whenever you retire. And our patients, at least in women's health, will range from teenagers until the rest of their lives. And so frequently there's overlap, but sometimes you could be well older or well younger than someone you're taking care of. And I would say for the most part, the dynamic doesn't make a big difference, but occasionally it's interesting. And when I started, I would say the majority of people I was, I was seeing were older than me. And for some of them, they were like shocked. They're like, who's this young guy who's taking care of me? And Unfortunately, now I think that's flipped a little bit that I'm older. It's an interesting thing. How, how does it make you feel to that? Old, mostly. Yeah, yeah. yeah mostly old. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember when we started, there was a occasionally, you know, Silverstein, you know, Mike would comment, you know, she's still older than me. You know, <laughs> that became fewer and fewer and fewer. Now he never over... says it. No, no, he never <laughs> says that. It's not, I don't think we've delivered anyone older than him currently. Excellent. Okay. And There's so a mountaintop that needs to be overcome. Right. But I think that would be pretty sharp <laughs> to reach that mountaintop. So you trained in the Bronx. What what brought you to medicine initially? That's a story. Growing up, I was I loved animals. I thought the encyclopedia of like the animal kingdom was like the coolest book ever. I'd wake up early and like go through all that. So people always thought that I was going to end up in veterinary medicine or like a biologist or, or something. Or owning a pet store. Or owning a pet store. Yes, that would be pretty, pretty similar in line. I really like that kind of stuff, but I really enjoyed science. And and one day I, I I remember I was like nine or 10 years old and my mom was doing laundry. It was, it was the weekend. And I just, I went, I ran down the stairs and I was just like, mom, you got to hold on. I was like, mom, do not wash those socks. We had just recently come back from like Dick's Sporting Goods. And, you know, I had these like really fresh like three pairs of socks and they're they're like crisp soft like they're, they're the perfect pair of socks and i'd been wearing the same pair of socks for the entire week and i knew at that at that right young is age that a that problem it wasn't they were still soft okay <laughs> they were still soft and i took them off when you know when I was about to go outside and play and I'd, I'd put them on when I get back inside. Ladies and gentlemen, a nine-year-old boy. <laughs> that, this is this is Same what, socks every day. <laughs> same socks every day, but but not when I'm like, you know, getting dirty. And I told her, I was like, you can't wash these socks. Once you wash them, they're ruined. She's like, you literally just got them seven days ago. They need to be washed. Socks get washed. 
And I was like, I don't want them if they've been washed. And she's like, well, then you're going to have to make enough money to support this luxurious lifestyle of, of only wearing socks one time and then throwing them away. And I was and like, the first thing you came up with was medicine. Well, I was <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, my mom was like, you're either going to be an engineer wrong, a lawyer, possibly, or a doctor. And I was like, doctor sounds great. <laughs> and since then, it's it's just been a, a process of like checking off boxes. That's the beauty of like having coming from an immigrant family. They're like, well, we have done our research and we have found out that there are five boxes that need to be checked off. You got to volunteer in a hospital. You got to go to college. You got to be a pre-med major. And then you somehow have to get into med school and then you'll be set. Right. And you'll have all the socks you want forever. All the socks you want forever. Ironically, Sarp is the least likely person in our office to actually wear socks on a <laughs> daily basis. So I'm, I'm not I'm, wearing socks right now. Exactly. I'm, try, I'm trying to figure that out. I'm probably second least, uh, at least amongst the men. But uh, OK, so the Sarp sock dream is being lived. That's it great. Is. All right. So you got into medicine for the socks, which is a unique answer. Right. Which I'll take. And so how did you decide OBGYN? At the time, we didn't really know that many doctors. You know, I come from a long line of like engineers. So everyone was like, you know, some sort of calculator nerd. And the the one doctor we knew in our area in upstate New York was a obstetric anesthesiologist. And so he took me under his wing and I started volunteering at the hospital he worked at, which happened to be box number one, the box number one volunteer at a hospital. Right. My affinity to checking boxes off, you know, would, would culminate in, in residency. But so I started working there and, and I was just in maintenance and I built a water fountain in the in the front of the of the building with like a bunch of other maintenance guys over the summer. And then people started to wonder like why this 11 year old boy was, you know, working from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. because my, you know, my parents were using it as daycare over the summer. This 11 year old boy with impeccable socks, right. impeccable hosiery <laughs> is, is building a water fountain for us. Wow. Who is this? Who is this young Turkish boy with and great he, socks? He would be there, you know, for 12 hours. And and finally, they started to realize the optics of like having a 11, 12 year old kid day after day working on the yard and, and mowing the lawn and building a fountain was, was probably less than ideal. So they brought me indoors to like human resources and I helped with folders. And every once in a while, I'd go to the phlebotomy lab and learn how to draw blood. Or, you know, I'd go into the operating rooms and like, watch them do surgery they they did it was a it was a women's only hospital so that's really where i i sort of got my foundation for women's health there's one story that they love talking about even to this day i i walked in and i was really nervous my first day and i was just kind of like fidgety and the, and the lady at the front was like are you okay and i was like yeah i'm fine 45 minutes goes by i'm still sort of fidgety she's like what's wrong i was like i really got to go to the bathroom but I know this is a ladies hospital and I just didn't, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to go to the bathroom. But, you know, 2019 woke Sarp knows any bathroom <laughs> is a bathroom I can use. That's where I started to develop an affinity for taking care of women, working with women. And and ultimately in, in college, I, I took a course that gave me the opportunity to look more into women's rights. And, and that's where things started to take off. A little, a little faster. Now, you said that you're from an immigrant family. Yeah. This is how many generations back are we talking about? I mean, my my mom and my dad were brought over here on uh, to to teach and get their masters. And so they were on, adults. Like, yeah, at the yeah. they were, were they already married or? Yeah, they got married after three years of undergrad in Turkey. And then they came over here. And do you feel that being from an immigrant family that gave you or certainly gave them a different perspective than maybe the other kids, you know, in your classes or your social groups or whatever it was? Or was that pretty typical where you grew up? Yeah, I mean, my my dad, you know, he he didn't come from much. He worked really hard. And same thing with my mom. Like they they just in, in Turkey, there's your entire career, you know, academic professional, everything is hinged on an SAT like test that you take at the end of high school. And like, when I mean everything, I mean everything, where you go to college, what your major is going to be, what kind of jobs you're able to apply to. So like being rigorous in your studies and like studying, putting the work in every single day is like a big part of like Turkish culture. They'll have entire buildings, these massive buildings where every single floor is just desks 
for students to like go study. And like, that's what you did for all of high school. Like when you're done with, with school, you go and you study and you study for like hours and hours and hours because this test is so massive. You know, it, it has the ability to like lift people up because, because they, you don't, you don't pay for the government pays for your education. But you have to, you know, you have to, score, achieve. you have to achieve. And so there's there's an immense amount of pressure on kids. You know, things are changing, but that's where my parents sort of came from. And so when I was like, I would love to watch some television on uh, on the weekends and they're like, nope, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. But, you know, a lot. So I don't know. I guess all the reading helps. I know some things. I don't know. I don't know a lot, but I know some things. And I want to talk a little bit more about what you said that in college you had your interest sparked in women's rights and advocacy. And, you know, for our listeners, SARP is extremely active in advocacy. It's it's one of your passions, isn't it? It is. It, and, and, yeah. Yeah. And tell me about that journey. So it started at least maybe in earnest when you were in college and you started learning about it more specifically. But where did that lead you? Of course, that like sparked everything was uh, international law seminar and the th- thesis that I ended up working on for the semester was the use of gender-based tools of war in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And I focused on the DR Congo, where there were so many warring factions and and the, the most effective way that these different factions were able to gain territories and maintain control over regions was by decimating the female population, oftentimes through pretty violent means. And so, you know, the international community's response to that was part of my thesis and, and looking at how, how gender-based violence could be used as, as, a, as a tool of war and, and control and power. And I was pretty ab- abysmally dismayed at how the, the co- international world just has no means of controlling how women throughout various societies are are treated. And then at the end of that, I was like, mom, I got to go to the DR Congo. And she's like, nope. <laughs> you know, no. she's like, no, 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 no. So I, I started looking more domestically and, and you know, obviously stumbled across abortion rights. And that was a big part of sort of where I, I started my advocacy journey was, you know, I, I was president of the board of directors for medical students for choice in my second year of med school. Spent a lot of time with them. I'm, I'm currently on the board of directors for Physicians for Reproductive Health, which is a physician advocacy organization based here in New York City. I've also started to get involved with, you know, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, I'm one of their young leaders, sit on the young leader board and sort of bring up issues that that are important to millennials. I, I guess I'm considered a millennial. We have, you know, a different perspective to offer um, the, the specialty of OBGYN. I actually just got back from D.C. from the college's uh, four-day advocacy fly into the hill where we go and we meet with our elected officials and and advocate for a lot of a lot of things that that should be different for our patients and and our colleagues. Right, and you've done this before. This is something you've been doing for years. This is yeah. This is my uh, fourth year. Right, and is is this the context in which you were doing radio interviews and you know whatnot? My first interview was as president of Medical Students for Choice in San Francisco. And and at the time I was talking about how it was that an organization like Medical Students for Choice, which its mission is to to educate tomorrow's abortion providers, because there was a, a huge gap in medical education in the in the early to mid nineties, wasn't being taught. And so this organization came up, um, you know, it was created by uh, Dr. Jody Steinauer, who's at UCSF right now. And so it, it filled a, a much needed gap of, of training med students to, to take care of, of patients and women in a compassionate manner, because up until then, it, abortions had been relegated to outpatient clinics. And, you know, they, they were outside of the realm of medical education for a very long time. I'm curious, because you've been in New York for all of your training, mm-hmm. at least uh, for medical school and for residency and, and now your practice. And New York is it's a pretty liberal state uh, as states go. And you're talking about you know California, which is a pretty liberal state. And I'm curious with your efforts and advocacy, what has been your experience uh, either personally or just you know what you've known from around 
how does that impact states that aren't, you know, the red states, so to speak? Are the the medical students and the the residents in those states are they yearning for this and it's not available to them, or is it that they themselves maybe aren't? you know, as interested in it as maybe the population wouldn't be as interested or what has been your experience in that regard? I actually find that some of the bravest, most ardent physician advocates that I know are from those more conservative states. The one thing that I've learned is that you can't legislate away abortion. It's a it's a part of women's health. It's it's health care. It's, you know, a safe procedure. And, and there's a reason why women continue to come and seek care on this issue. You know, unintended pregnancy is something that happens to anyone, regardless of your age, your race, how many children you have. You know, there there are times certain pregnancies uh, are either unintended, um, undesired, or both. And so being able to put power back into the hands of patients of women is, is something that I find very, you know, it's it's what drives me and and I find that even though I'm in a very liberal space and and I feel safe and I'm privileged to be able to pursue these passions um a lot of my friends are not and they they struggle either with you know course directors in reproductive health uh at the medical school level where where they don't want to talk about you know IUDs or they they call plan B an abortifacient or you know they there's no conceivable medical sort of scenario in which an abortion is is worth even learning about, let alone performing, to, you know, residents who want to learn the skills because, you know, performing an MBA or or a dilation and curatage can be life saving in certain, you know, medical scenarios. And a lot of my friends come from places where they either are intentionally sheltered from this education or there are no providers in that area that that are willing to teach. And I think that's such an important point also because so much of the discussion or debate or arguments or whatever it is in this mm-hmm. country regarding abortion lose the fact that there are many instances where the procedures are needed even for people who themselves would never choose to have an abortion, right? Correct. Obviously, there are some there are some women who would choose to have an abortion. There's some women who would not choose to have an abortion for whatever reasons, religious, moral, what have you. But there are instances, for example, if let's say a baby passes away inside, mm-hmm. and you're talking about someone who's you know 22 or 23 weeks pregnant, and the baby is no longer alive, you have to baby has to come out one way or another, and right. there's procedures that can do that safely. But if you're not trained to do them, that really puts a woman in that circumstance in a very difficult situation medically for her health. Or for example, she's in the second trimester, her water's broken and she's becoming infected and very sick. And they're really, like you said, it's a life-saving procedure for the mother. And so people might argue about sort of what someone should or shouldn't do in an elective scenario or whatnot. And that's all reasonable, obviously. But there are instances where it's it's just there's just no choice in that sense and if no one can do the procedure physically they just don't have the skills or training to do it it's really difficult and sometimes it's really dangerous for women and i think people forget that uh, occasion like you said if people aren't trained if there's no one who knows how to do these things that's a very difficult spot to be in medically right do, do you find that you're making headway in terms of your advocacy obviously advocacy is it's almost like hitting your head against well, it's very sharp. Uh, it's <laughs> it's a hard thing, and it's it's not just for women's rights; it's for anything in advocacy because there there's frequently a reason things are the way they are, and there's challenges in trying to make change in a local or a state or a national level is very difficult. And people who are very passionate work at it. Do you do you have sort of you know, successes or accomplishments or things that you can see like, yes, this was really helpful, or is it just about the journey? Or where do you see that? Since 2016, this has been very, you know, front page, very loud in in, in the media, both social print and otherwise. But the interesting part is this was all work that had been going on behind the scenes for decades. Yeah, long time. Right, like for a very long time. So in terms of, 
you know, how visible it is these days, it's that's only been for four years, you know, like advocates have been working on this for quite some time. All this to say, you know, successes wax and wane, right? There, there, there are setbacks, you know, but overall, I think I like to hope that that things are a little better, but they're not they're not headed in a good direction. One of the things that what I realized that we're always doing and that can be really exhausting for physician advocates is just the enormous amount of defensive play, right? There's there's everything that we're doing, the, the, the advocacy that we do very infrequently, are we actually proactively trying to grant rights or secure choice for our patients? It's, it's always... We're trying to head off attempts by politicians or legislators who who genuinely are not experts in in what they're what they're legislating, and we're we're trying to you know decrease the damage that's going to happen, you know, if they they make illegal the the safe, the most common way of having a second trimester abortion. You know, there there are many states that are that are mandating scientifically inaccurate measures when you're when you're counseling some uh, a patient on you know having having a procedure or having an abortion or even in options counseling right when you when you have a patient who you know just finds out that they're pregnant and they they don't know how to feel about it and you're you're just giving them your options there are some law there's some states out there where you have a script that you have to follow or you go to jail you know like it, it's just for that's the biggest difference that I that I see going back to your your other question about, you know, what is it like for for your friends who are in conservative states, they have to sit, sometimes figure out creative and innovative ways of staying within the bounds of very scientifically inaccurate laws that restrict the way that they can care for patients. And that that patient interference, that interference, the, the legislative interference in the patient physician relationship I think it's something that, you know, across all specialties, across all aspects of medicine, like as, as physicians, we can, we can appreciate that that's, that's unwelcome. Yeah. Doctors traditionally do not like people telling them what to do and how to take care of patients. No, it's very complicated. It's, it's hard stuff to know what to do. And for each person, it's different. And there's so much, you know, knowledge that's required and experience and understanding and psychology and there's so much that goes into it and to have someone just tell you you can do a you can't do b or this it's it makes it very difficult to take good care of people and we're also bound by our duty as physicians and our ethics and oaths we take right to take good care of people in the way we know best and if it's against the law to do that it's it is very complicated and challenging right the the other thing i wanted to talk about which is I, I just think it's a fascinating topic, and it's probably even more pronounced maybe in the advocacy you're doing, is that here we are, two men talking about women's rights. Ah, there it is. And it's, you know, I, I take care of women for, women for a living. You take care of women for a living. The Nowadays, probably in the U.S., about 50%, give or take, of OBGYNs are men and 50% are women. But that's because the the folks that trained earlier were 80 or 90% men. And so now if you look at a training program, so people coming into the field, it's probably 80 or 90% women and 10 or 20% men. So as things progress with time, it'll clearly be more women than men. And I'm happy to be taking care of women. I don't see it as an issue at all. And so I don't find it uncomfortable or difficult. I think it's fantastic. In advocacy, do you find yourself as a man either, number one, just as a minority, that there's not as many of you, and number two, do you find that your advocacy is taken more seriously, less seriously? You see no difference whatsoever because the people who you are meeting with are, you know, open to whoever. How how has that been for you? I mean, we're definitely men when it comes to some of the social issues. You know, you'll you'll find men all over the physician issues. You know anything when it comes to reimbursement or practice or you know there there are plenty of male identifying advocates out there right. but it's you know when it turns to social issues you don't see as much as many sometimes it's because of you know individual comfort with with those issues sometimes it's about apathy i've i've seen it i've seen it all 
Sometimes it's about misinformation. Being sort of a, a, a minority for the first time in my life as a, as a white man, it's an interesting perspective because my my job at that point is really to support my my female colleagues on their on their advocacy journey. I often try to take a step back and you know be there as like a body and to to help mentor you know young women who are just starting to dip their toes in, in the waters. I try to remain as cognizant as possible of the fact that like this is not a this is not my space, right? Like this is not an area where I have lived experiences. You know, I've never had a speculum exam. I've never and will never be faced with an unintended, undesired pregnancy. How I navigate those, I try to be very careful of of both the gender, but also the the racial implications of the advocacy work that that I engage in. And so that that I think that requires a little bit of uh, learned skill. Um, there have definitely been times where I've taken missteps. Trying to keep an open mind in in that area is really important. And it's it's been important for me. There are a lot of lessons to be learned, not just from physician advocates, but but other ad- patient advocates, dual advocates, nurse advocates. There are a lot of a lot of people who have been doing this work for a very long time, and and recognizing that I'm still a very young advocate. Um, and I have much to learn sort of, you know, moving forward in my career. Um, I think that that's, that's something that I've been, been working on, um, in terms of my, my opinion or, you know, my advocacy being taken more seriously than, than someone else. I definitely get questions about, you know, my intentions. Questioning whether they're sincere. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, white dudes have not made it easy. <laughs> to, like we're not the most trustworthy people. But you would think logically to be the opposite because yeah, these are very for many people they're very emotional, they're very personal mm-hmm. obviously for a lot of people topics. And to approach it as someone who is you're not from the outside of the topic because you're a women's healthcare provider and you're an expert in women's healthcare, and this is what you do every day, right. but you're sort of an outsider as the person on the other end of it, obviously. But for you to stand up and say, I'm not a woman, this isn't going to happen to me. It doesn't you know, affect me personally, but I believe strongly in this as someone who provides care for women and tries to help them. And I think that what needs to be done is A, B, and C to help them. You know, I believe that they need more rights. I would think that it would be the opposite. But I guess people look into things different ways, or maybe they're just trying to find a way to not pay attention. I don't know. I think that's probably what it is, right? Because I I think the perspective that you're talking about is definitely something that if I wasn't the only one standing up, right? If there was a community of white male individuals who were like, hey, this is wrong. This needs to change you need to listen to us and, you know, you need to, more importantly, you need to listen to women. I think that would be different. But when we're sort of sparse and increasingly we're starting to, you know, the Me Too movement has showcased a lot of past transgressions of white dudes in our, in our field. I I think it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, I do, I, you know, to, to sort of earn that trust back. All the spaces that I enter into, they're not my spaces. Right. And I think that a lot of it is because of the history and the past and so many experiences and so many things that people have been through. You don't tend to find people, for example, questioning someone who's never had cancer, advocating for people for cancer research, right? That no one thinks about that in a sense. And no one says, well, you didn't have cancer. Why would I pay attention to you? Because that's just not the same type of topics we're talking about and mm-hmm. the same type of, but it's not as, I don't know, maybe potentially combative in a sense, like that's been in the past. And so this is more ripe for mistrust and questioning someone's motives, which is unfortunate, but I guess it's just a reality. I understand it. I understand yeah. where it's coming from. I actually was just having this conversation. You know, w- one of the things I get a lot of is how often do you have women that don't want to see you because you're a male OBGYN? You mean patients? I get patients, yeah. uh, you know, my colleague asked me and, and, you know, I get, I get young med students, you know, male med students who are like, I'm considering OBGYN, but I just don't know. 
I'm a, you know, I'm going to end up being a man in an, in, in an OBGYN world. Like, what, what is that like? I have an answer to that question because I get asked all the time also, what, what, how did, how did you respond? I'm curious. I mean, I, I tell, I'm like, listen, if, if she doesn't want to see me, then I, that's, I, I totally understand it. Like no hard feelings. Like, you know, I, I, I understand that people come to reproductive health and, and women's health with their own lived experiences. And, and unfortunately, some of those experiences end up being traumatic. Statistically speaking, you know, it's perpetrated by a man. So I, I understand sort of where where women have different perspectives and it, it's not that they, they don't owe it to me to to disclose their traumatic history and so at, at times on the surface i'm just i'm like okay you know i'm accepting of it that's where that conversation came from there's another male ob and and he was like well but you know i don't i don't have to have given birth i don't have to have you know experienced a menstrual cycle to be able to help guide and take care of patients compassionately. Yeah, I, I mean, I have that talk with med students all the time when they ask me the same question because they're curious. And because OBGYN is a fascinating and interesting and exciting field, and it's just as exciting and interesting to men, medical students, as it is to women. And they ask me, they're like, well, are you, how does it work for you? Are you worried about it? And I say something very similar. I mean, when I started in our practice, it was actually all men. It was five men in the practice. Now it's about 50-50, give or take. And ultimately, if someone doesn't want to see a male doctor, that's fine. So there's plenty of all-female practices, and God bless, and they should go there. And I think if that's who they want to see, that's fine. So just like some people don't want to see older doctors, some people don't want to see younger doctors, some people don't want to see whoever it is. You know, people have their preferences, and that's fine. You know, fortunately, we live in a world and in a, I don't know, the world, at least a country with a lot of doctors and a lot of opportunities. But I never found it to be a big issue. I think that most women that I come across really just want to see someone who's good mm -hmm. and someone who's caring and someone who communicates well and makes good decisions. And ultimately, it has not been a factor in our practice. It hasn't right. been a factor in my career personally. There are so many people who are happy to see anyone. And I haven't seen any trends in either direction. And so I tell men if they want to go into a B, they should do it. It's a wonderful field. It's a wonderful career. It's a great way to help people and to be involved in medicine. It's exciting scientifically and academically and in all regards. And okay, there's always challenges in any field you go into, uh, but it's really not a, a practical issue for men going into OB, as long as they don't mind training in an environment, like you said, like when, when they're the minority, which right. is, if, if, if it bothers someone to be a minority in training, then they shouldn't be in that training, but it really shouldn't in that sense. Certainly didn't for me. In my training, it was, my residency class was three men and four women, which even at the time was slightly more men than you would normally see. Typical, you know, residency now would be about 10%, I think, men. My year was weird. We ended up with five men in, in a class of 11. Yeah, that is unusual. It was very unusual. Right. Never happened again, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're, so you're still involved in advocacy, and now you're also practicing OBGYN. You're doing a lot of deliveries, yep. a lot of care in the office, a lot of gynecology procedures and whatnot. Full scope. And what's it like in your your early time out of residency, your first couple of years? What's that? What's that slope like? That learning curve of you know just total. It's totally different from residency. Obviously, it's very different. It's very different. You know, it's the most immediate sort of change is obviously you know it just hits you when you realize that like the decisions sort of stop with you, right? Like, like you're supposed, you're the person, uh, for like years, you always sort of get you, whenever you get a tough question, you kind of take it and then you like turn around and you like look back at the attending and, and realizing that like, there's no one behind me. It's just me. That's been, that's definitely been a change, but also, you know, with that comes, you know, an immense sense of like satisfaction and, and, you know, being able to, to go day to day and take care of these patients and, and, and help them make those decisions. I, I've really enjoyed the relationships that, that have come with that. And also just like the constant imposter syndrome, you know, just like constantly being like, 
I can't believe I'm done with training, you know? Right. It is, it is remarkable. I, I wrote a piece for fellows finishing MFM fellowship and saying, okay, you know, 11 years of medical training, and now you're ready to be terrified to take care of your first patient. Right, right. And, and it's, I remember my first year in practice was the most exciting year. You, I learned more in one year in practice than I learned in all of my fellowship for sure. The relationships I developed with my patients in that first year are probably the strongest I've ever had. I'm still close with so many of the people I met and delivered and took care of yeah. during that first year. And coming to work every day was so exciting, exhausting. It was like a whirlwind because you're just learning and learning and learning. Absolutely. And, and just trying to, and it's not just like learning facts and figures, but just how to do things, how to talk to people, how to navigate a totally different system. And and it's just, it's really exciting. That is also, you know, it it always catches me by surprise. You know, I'll, I'll go in and, you know, the, I've been doing the same thing in residency, like day in, day out. And when I'm now in the office, it's like, what, you know, there, there were a couple like first where I was just like, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm like, there's a different way that, that things are set up. Like even, even the setup of the room, you know, it takes some getting used to, but yeah, it's constantly learning. Like every patient, comes with like a completely different set of questions and and experiences and history and so it's been it's been awesome like adapting to that and i i don't think i've had a single day where i've like felt the dread of residency like it, it's nice to wake up and be like i'm super excited about today right what a great feeling well we're listen we're super excited to see your career continue to unfold and develop dr sarp axel obgyn advocate sock aficionado he's gonna <laughs> you know just be a, a real big name in this field for many years to come sarp thank you so much for coming on health the woman we are definitely going to have you on many more times and talk about lots of stuff thanks so much nady it's been a pleasure thank you for listening to the healthful woman podcast to learn more about our podcast please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com that's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.